Okay. To the panel, she is the author of uh, Bear Brass, Imagining Early Melbourne and a City Lost and Found. Sorry, and another book, sorry. A City Lost and Found, Wheel and the Wreckers, Melbourne. She's a member of the Library Board of Victoria. Please welcome Robin and Nia. Next to Robin is a professorial fellow at the University of Melbourne specialising in the social history of France since 1780. He's a fellow of the Australian Academy of the Humanities and Academy of Social si uh, Sciences and was awarded a centenary medal for services to education in 2003 and since then has done nothing. So <laughs> uh, please welcome Professor Peter McPhee. In 2007, she was awarded a State Library Staff Creative Fellowship and uh, is the current curator of the uh, library's exhibition, Till You Drop, Shopping a Melbourne History, which is on right now at the library. Uh, she completed her master's degree in public history at the University of Melbourne in 2008. Please welcome Jane Rhodes. <laughs> and finally, uh, L.M. Robinson is or, is or has been a tutor, university lecturer, freelance writer and teacher. She is the author of Madame Brussels, This Moral Pandemonium. Please welcome L.M. <laughs> Robinson. Uh, but for the sake of tonight, we're going to call L.M. Lenny. But if you're looking, if you're going to the net, go with L.M. Robinson. Panel, thank you so much for being here. Uh, very, very simply, tell us a story about Melbourne. One of you. <laughs> How about you, Robin? You start. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to bring the mic up. Oh, God. How tricky. This is where you need to be vertical. I like a podium, but uh, I'll do without it. Tell you a story about Melbourne that changed the way I see the city. Is that the yes. kind of thing you were thinking of? That's exactly what mm, I was thinking okay, of. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I, uh, every, everything I've ever read about historic Melbourne has changed the way I see the city. Um, probably recently the thing that's changed the way I see the city most is seeing um, Elizabeth Street uh, serving its natural uh, and proper purpose um, two weeks, two and a half weeks ago, uh, being the uh, stormwater drain for Mel the city of Melbourne. I'd, never, I'd only seen the photos before and, and read about the lakes that used to form at the intersections of Burke and Collins Street and horses would drown in them and so on. But, uh, um, but I saw it for myself that day and it was, it was a privilege and, and, uh, and an honour and, and I really felt as if I was living history that day. Uh, but apart from that, in writing particularly and most recently my book about Wheel and the Wreckers Melbourne, Wheel and the Wrecker having changed the face of Melbourne more than any family um, or family-based concern, um, everything I read about them and what they did and the, the sort of palimpsest that was their Melbourne, the layers upon layers of, of city that they were instrumental in altering. Uh, I now walk around the city even more than I did before and can really see the ghosts of past, past layers of Melbourne. But so, so in thinking about this I thought where's a place in Melbourne uh, where that is more true than any other. And the parts of Melbourne, the parts of any place that I like best, are those that are, are easiest not to notice. So you walk past them and just think there's nothing distinct, distinctive or, or distinguished about that place. But when you know the stories, when you know its secrets, when you know the stories and what's under the surface, what was there before, uh, you never can walk past it again the same way. The, really the ghost of that building or of that, the happenings there are in place for you forever and you have them in your pocket weighing nothing. Um, so thinking about that, there's a, um, a particularly undistinguished, I think, part of Melbourne uh, the, the west of the city in particular, anyway, down towards Spencer Street. Is, it's, it's easy to walk through there and see nothing but your own reflection in the front of glass buildings. Um, but there's a, the block which forms... Now, think about the, the... This makes you think about the topography of Melbourne too, the shape of the, the, the skin and bones beneath the city um, and the land the city was built on. So it's really the peak of the hill, which is... Uh, in that part of Melbourne, it's, it's up around William Street. Between Queen and William Street is the crest of a hill. If you walk up Burke Street from either direction, you're aware of walking uphill and you get to that point between, uh, between William and Queen Street and you're at the peak. And if you look at your Melways, there's a thing called the Melways Mobility Map in the early pages of the Melways and it has arrows 
of di differing colours depending on the steepness. It's a bit like a topographic map of the central city for people who are, for instance, wheelchair bound. They know which parts of Melbourne to avoid. Um, and this is a part that you should avoid if you're in that situation because there are, there are steep bits going all the way up there. Anyway, at that point, uh, there's now, um, in Burke Street, between William and Queen, a lot of the block is taken up by a very brown sort of 1970s, originating in the 1970s, but recently um, revivified a bit, that belong to the National Bank. And the National Bank seems to have perpetrated more architectural crimes against the, the central city <laughs> than most in the 70s, and there were lots of them. But the National Bank's buildings were just shockers. And this is one of them. As I say, they've done it up a bit lately. But it, it occupies a lot of this block. And it's next to the, uh, the bluestone building that's at the corner that used to be a wool store. Uh, and the wool stores along an expanse of that block before. So you're at the peak of the hill. You've got in Little, Little Burke Street, hard by, uh, the Supreme Court. And you look down the little alley beside the blue stone building at the corner of William and, King, uh, William and Burke, and you see the dome of the Supreme Court Library. And it's a lovely little, um, little aperture, a lovely little snap shot through Melbourne. And looking through those narrow alleys or laneways, even one like little Lonsdale down here, it's through those narrow apertures that you really get a sense of the ups and downs of the city landscape, more so than with the wide streets. There's probably a reason for that scientifically, but I don't get it. Um, but it's great. So you look there and you see the, uh, the dome, but along there where the <laughs> unremarkable uh, landscape of fairly modern office blocks is, I know from knowing what Whelan's wrecked there, um, what used to be there, there was, for instance, St Patrick's Hall, which was the hall of the St Patrick's Society of Australia Felix, started in the 1840s there. Uh, obviously, great Australia Day celebration, uh, Australia Day, St Patrick's Day celebrations there, for instance. There was an Irish school for Irish kids in the neighbourhood. Um, and it's where Melbourne's, Victoria's first legislative council, their first own, own brand of government um, sat because they didn't have a parliament house. So it was really important to Melbourne, that place. We finally seized a bit of government away from Sydney and our homegrown one sat there in this borrowed hall in 1851. The separation ball, again, a great occasion where we tore ourselves away from New South Wales. All of these are great landmarks in Melbourne's history because what Melbourne is, of course, is not Sydney. That's what we can say. It's not <laughs> Sydney. That's, that is how we define ourselves. It's, it's, it's not Sydney. So this was a great not-Sydney not place. This is the m most not-Sydney place in early Melbourne. Um, so that was, a, that was a terrific place, pulled down in the uh, uh, 50s, in the 50s, just as the National Trust was starting up here and beginning to grow some teeth, but too late. Whelans were told to start wrecking it from the back so that it would be completely disfigured before anybody could uh, rumble what they were up to, and that's what they did. Um, so that was there, and right next door to it was the synagogue, Melbourne's first synagogue. Before that, um, uh, the Jewish population used to meet in uh, a draper's shop down in Collins Street. Um, but from 1846 or seven, they met in this uh, synagogue um, in Burke Street, and land, government land was allocated for it, uh, despite protests from the colonial office in England, who said land should only be given for worship for Christian faiths. But uh, you know, this got somehow got under the bar, and that was a win. Um, and beside that was Synagogue Lane. Now, if you walk along Burke Street, you'll see a sign on a little laneway that says Little Queen Street formerly Synagogue Lane or Synagogue Place. Ha ha. That was one of the sinks of iniquity of Melbourne in the 1860s and 70s. There was a, a boarding house for seamen, and that's not a euphemism, although it could have been, <laughs> a boarding house for seamen in, in that lane. Like, and that pretty much set the tone. That was there from early on. And the, uh, it was renowned, apart from anything, for the foul language that could be heard you know, anywhere within earshot of there, and particularly from the children, the children of that laneway, of whom there were lead um, uh, were always barefoot and dirty, never at school when they were meant to be, and they swore a lot more like sailors. Um, there were, you know, sort of uh, back street knocking shops there. You wouldn't call them, distinguish them with the name of brothels, I don't think. But and there were always fist fights and people being rolled for their cash and and what have you. And of course, 
what, it, what the civic authorities do whenever there's an outbreak of that sort of stuff that's identified in the newspapers with scandalised uh, editorials is they change the name of it, and that was what happened in that case. The same thing happened with Romeo Lane and Juliet Terrace, which are now Liverpool and um, Crossley Streets up the other end of town. Um, just changed the name. So there was that great place, and you'd never know it now. It's just the side walls of big buildings. You'd never know the... Oh. I've lost my noise. You'd never know the shenanigans that had happened there. So you can see the, the, the way these places come to life for me. And that part of town, it was also where Redmond Barry had his first cottage, not, not at the same time as the shenanigans nearby. But he had a cottage there that stayed there until Whelan's pulled it down in the 1920s with a beautiful mulberry tree that was the only trace amongst the industrial backyards um, in, the, in the 1920s. He had his first library there in the back kitchen where respectable working men were invited to, to thumb his journals and so on, and that was before he started this joint next door. Um, so this, this all comes alive for me all the time, and there's only traces of it to be found in the, in the names of the streets, or the former names of the streets of some of the residents who lived there, the people, the Thompson family, whose little two-up, two-down cottage was pulled down. It had the cottage by the sea chalked on the front door when the wreckers arrived, and then there, the little street, Thompson Street, is named after them. So none of this would come to you when you're sitting in Mavita on the terrace there, but it's underneath your feet nonetheless. Well, after listening to that, Robin, it just makes uh, my first trip into town as a young boy even more remarkable when uh, my mum and dad brought me into Burke Street and said, look, there's the spaghetti tree. So <laughs> <laughs> we've got very, very uh, similar education in Melbourne. Um, Jane, would you yeah, like to follow Robin or, did, or has she covered some of your stuff? I've what? taken it all. Well, no, because I think, Robin, what you're saying is really quite interesting, that the idea of walking your city and getting to know that urban environment and that built environment is really when you do get to know your city. In particular, it's the buildings and the footpaths and the streets. And for my area of research, the shops and where we really can get some interesting um, histories about, yeah, about Melbourne. Because there's one particular shop that was in Burke Street. It was Cole's Book Arcade. Mm. And that story in particular reveals a lot about uh, what was happening in Melbourne sort of in that late 19th century and had lots of surprises uh, that I found during my research uh, that were at the store. In, in this arcade, not only did uh, Cole, E.W. Cole was his name, Edward, he had books and stationery and those kind of usual things, but uh, he also had uh, amusements. So uh, he had a monkey cage, uh, we could see monkeys, he had a fernery, he had an aviary, he had a tea salon, he had, there was a band. You could um, buy biscuits and cakes and things like that. And why this was really interesting is because Cole had turned the idea of shopping into uh, an, an entertainment experience. So it wasn't just about going to the shops and buying something. Like Chadston. Like Chadston. <laughs> he was early Chadston. Right. Yeah, it was all in the one, all sort of that one-stop shop kind of thing. <laughs> and that's what really surprised me about uh, doing the research on Melbourne is that there was this wonderful place, you know, in the middle of the city, you know, at that time. And Cole at that time was really tapping into what he had seen at the intercolonial and the international exhibitions where for the first time, you know, newly manufactured goods were actually on display as if they were museum objects, sort of, you know, ornaments or fancy framed pictures and things like that. And then you could actually, uh, what Cole did, you could go and buy these things uh, in the arcade. And what actually happened at this time is that Melbourne was taken over by a craze which was known as uh, bricker bracamania because so, uh, yeah, it was likened to a disease because so, uh, so uh, passionate were Melbourne shoppers for, to get their hands on this, you know, decorative goods to decorate their home. Oh. But, uh, so, they, so they couldn't have a single surface that didn't have a decorative a porcelain dog or no, something? No, like they did not uh, <laughs> exercise any restraint. <laughs> Even though pamphlets and books are actually uh, for, were sold about how one should decorate their home, so they showed little restraint because, you know, how could they? All of a sudden these goods were on offer at very affordable prices in places like the arcade. And so... They couldn't help themselves. <laughs> Your exhibition? Uh, uh, one section is, yeah. It looks at the arcade and you know, where it was in Burke Street. It's where the David Jones food court is now. So, yeah. so that's sort of one uh, experience inside a store. But another experience in a store, which is out on the street, was actually the My Christmas Windows. And this is happening much later. This is I mean, 1956 was the first My Christmas Windows. And they were actually uh, invented by a Melbourne... Um, uh, man, Fred Asmussen, who worked at the at Matt Myers, and um, he wanted to create a, a, a present or a gift to Melbourne. And he did that by using, you know, that, that old saying, you know, more front than Meyer is actually true because it's got actually 60 metres of flat glass it spans. And instead of um, putting in, you know, goods that you could buy, he actually put in sort of a fairy tale scene or a, or a Disneyland scene. 
And um, these were unveiled to the Melbourne public, like I said, in 1956, and they were a hit straight away, massive success. So again, we've got people coming into the city and experiencing Burke Street by, not, you know, by looking at these windows. So it's another way, yeah, again, people are interacting with their city and having an experience with it. And I'm sort of, I'm always pleasantly surprised that yeah, people do that and they have an experience with it. Do you call it Myers or Maya? I interchange. What's yeah. the story? How come it became Maya all of a sudden after all those years of being Myers? That's a mystery that we could discuss. <sighs> yes. I thought you would know that. <laughs> well, in their advertising, they refer to themselves as Myers or Maya or the Maya Emporium. You know. I think it's a very similar theory as the Northland and Northlands. So oh, OK. Um, <laughs> <laughs> depends where you're from, Robin. <laughs> Peter, tell us a story about Melbourne. Yes, it's a very different sort of story, but it actually will in the record figures in this uh, as well, <laughs> and so does separation. Um, my story that really did change the way I think uh, about Melbourne and understand Melbourne is, uh, goes back 10 or 11 years. Uh, I, I went to live in Abbotsford in the 1980s and was aware at the time that I moved in that the great convent there on the Yarra was a slightly run-down university precinct. But uh, I was fascinated because, as an historian of France, I'd, I was told that it had this French altar in the, in the chapel convent. And that was about it. I mean, I knew very little. Uh, and it wasn't until 1999 when it was proposed that it be sold off and developed as a massive uh, housing complex. And people in Abbotsford set up this Abbotsford convent coalition and said, look, this shouldn't happen. Uh, that's when I started to learn, and it was extraordinary. I, Many of you will know the convent, and it has the most beautiful formal garden, and I keep thinking of what I learnt, almost like one of the, one of the roses in this garden sort of open, opening up its petals. I, mean, I, I learnt so much about the layers of Melbourne history just by um, awareness of what the people in that coalition were, f were finding. You know, for example, thinking about separation, Robin, it was first sold, that site was first sold on the Yarra to um, a man named Kerr, who at the time was regarded as one of the founders of separation in Victoria. And in the gardens of the convent, still today, is an oak tree that was planted in 1851 to recognise that separation from New South Wales. a massive tree. <laughs> the, the site was then sold off to the, uh, the Sisters of the Good Shepherd in 1863. I was uh, particularly interested to learn that because I knew that was a French religious order going back to the 1640s, which had been re-established after the French Revolution. Uh, and four Irish nuns who'd been trained in that order in Western France came here in 1863 to look after uh, fallen women, as, a, as they were called, in the aftermath of the, of the gold rush and the social upheaval. Here's your entree, Lenny. Uh, <laughs> in, the, in the aftermath of the gold rush and all of the social upheavals. That was the start of an extraordinary uh, undertaking because... Between 1868 and 1908, they built a whole complex of architecturally very rich buildings. By 1913, there were uh, over a thousand, uh, there were over 300 religious working there, and over a thousand women and children uh, who were there as well. It was a, a massive area. Many of the women, some of the women that you were talking about earlier, I suspect, who had uh, had been former prostitutes, who'd fallen on really tough times, or women who simply were poverty-stricken, couldn't look after themselves, their children, ended up there working in a huge industrial laundry. I mean, it's a site which is also very interesting for the economic and industrial history of, um, of, of Melbourne as well. But a series of very significant buildings that were established there by 1908 and by the 1960s, um, something like 30,000 women and children had been school students there or, or sheltered there in one way uh, or another. Of course, there were then huge changes in the nature of the Catholic Church and the, and the way it looked after people, and a huge change in the way that the state has started assuming responsibility. So that by the 1970s, there were only about 20 children at the convent and the sisters decided to, to leave. That's when the Whitlam government stepped in uh, and decided that it, it would buy it for educational purposes. It gave it to Lincoln Institute, then La Trobe. Uh, it also, however, or someone did ask Will on the record for a quote to actually just level the entire site. Just how much would it cost to clean it? Fortunately, the, uh, that didn't happen, but it was really in a state of limbo until this critical moment happened in 1999 when it was decided the, the, the best thing for the site was for a, this major firm of developers to, uh, to put up 
290 apartments, they would have had to have pulled down some of the buildings, erect new buildings in between what was left. It would have transformed that part of Melbourne totally. Uh, and yet, when this group of uh, people in Abbotsford said, we think we can devise a, a plan about a cultural, community, artistic, tourist place, they didn't just protest about the knocking down, they said, we've got a better idea. And today there are 200 people who go there every day to work, arts, uh, craftspeople and so on, 10,000 visitors. Uh, it's an extraordinary success. And there's one, other, there's one other layer to this that I learnt as well, um, and that was a revelation to me. And that is, of course, that site uh, is one of the places in Melbourne where you can go and get a sense, looking up the, the cliff face over to Kew, of what it might have been mm. when the first Europeans came up that river and encountered Wurundjeri people at the confluence of the Yarra and the Merri, mm. which was a key uh, corroboree site. And in fact, indigenous people remain part of this, the history of that area because some of the people that went through, some of the 30,000 women and children that went through were Aboriginal. They were part of the stolen generation. Some of the people that actually were housed in the convent for a time. But the wonderful thing, the turning of the circle, is that the, today, one of the tenants of the, of the convent is the Wurundjeri Council of Victoria. It's one of the major tenants in the convent buildings. So, I mean, I learned an enormous amount as an historian of France about uh, the, the cultural, economic, industrial, social, racial history of this extraordinary city. And in a way, the best thing I learned of all was the way in which, uh, in the history of a living city like Melbourne, that a group of people who were uh, passionate and well-informed and constructive could actually have a genuine say in the shaping of the city. Mm -hmm. In a way, the, the most wonderful surprise of, uh, of all was learning about, in a way, the democratic history of the city of Melbourne and how people, in all sorts of ways, have made it their, their space. Mm -hmm. uh, the Abbotsford Convent is an amazing place and I often have a similar experience when I go there I, I look up at the hill and, and just look and go wow that's where all the rich people live I <laughs> um, wonder if I'll ever get a, play, a house on the boulevard but uh, uh, Lenny mm. can you tell us a story about history? Well when I was thinking about this I, you know, a, a story about Melbourne that changed my view of Melbourne I couldn't really think of a single place or a single episode in history I sort of thought a lot about what Robin was saying, how through the process of engaging in historical research, it's like the city emerges for you. And when I was driving in here, I was trying to think of a metaphor to explain it. And I was thinking it's kind of like having a magic eraser. And the more research you do, you rub off a little bit of the old city, the, the, the current city and a bit of the old city appears and you rub off a bit more. And suddenly you're walking through the streets and you have this experience of being, like for me, in the 1880s, which is just so amazing. And obviously the place where that happened the most for me was up in the area where Madame Brussels' brothel was, which is just up the road on Lonsdale Street. And the more I researched the brothel and the more I researched the location, you know, I used to spend so much time standing opposite that site, which is now this hideous big glass thing, like you were saying and just mentally recreating it, like imagining this house that was back from the road and with the lattice out the front. And I, I'd go round the back and I'd just stand there among all these businessmen and businesswomen walking around me thinking, here was a walled garden where naked women were paraded on hot summer's nights. This is amazing. Or, <laughs> you know, this is, this is the alleyway where, um, you know, because she had, uh, Gorman Alley was uh, a secret entrance point for parliamentarians. She gave her chosen ones uh, keys and they could come in the back and enter through Gorman Alley into her, you know, um, her house of um, Alyssa, her Academy of Pleasure, as the um, as the uh, truth referred to it at one point. Her own version of my windows, really. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so every time, um, the more I learnt about that site, the more um, the current site was erased for me, and I began to see this 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 other place, and I couldn't go there without seeing the other place. I couldn't go there without imagining it and because my research obviously extended to learning a bit more about wider Melbourne as well um, you know that 
it, it sort of overtook my life while I was doing it. I'd get off at the time, um, you know, I was doing a lot of research at the State Library and, you know, reading old newspapers and things like that. And I'd get off the tram at Parliament and I'd walk down all the back alleys to get, because I wanted to feel like the parliamentarian. I wanted to, you know, how, do, how would you sneak up there? What would it be like? And I think I am the only person in Melbourne who would delight in a urine-soaked rubbish strew and alleyway because I'd be walking down there thinking, wow, this is evoking it for me. I can mentally visualise it. The smells, wonderful. Wonderful, you know the filth. Wonderful, um, and you know, in my book, I talk about one particular moment when I was doing one of my standing in front of the site of Madame Brussels with my eyes shut. So I'm sure they thought there was this lunatic woman who would always rock up at the site with her eyes closed. Um, and when I was doing that, police horses walked by, and the sound of the clip clopping of the police horses was like this magical portal through time. And I really felt like if I opened my eyes, I might just be lucky enough to see the madam herself strolling down Lonsdale Street, <laughs> you know, and a couple of her um, silken satin clad uh, soiled doves, as they were referred to, walking down the street as well. So, um, so I guess it was the whole process of research that really changed the way I look at the city and you know you're saying like you see these ghosts and um, even walking here you know my eyes go straight down to the Bluestone Foundation or my eyes go up yeah. to the rooms up the top and yeah. imagine people leaning out of them. Yeah.